Good morning, everybody. Um, it's great to see so much diversity in all the different uh, plat experimental platforms and gene lists that um, people have brought to the class. And um, so what I'm going to do now is give you a general introduction um, and a little bit of an overview uh, of what we're going to talk about in the course. Um, most of what we end up uh, focusing on is uh, sort of gene expression type examples. Um, not, not always. Um, actually, a couple of examples that will give you of pathway analysis use copy number variation and DNA methylation data. But a lot of the um, labs and, and things like that are kind of focused on gene expression. The reason for that is that that ends up being the, has traditionally been the majority of the types of genomics data that people have been analyzing with pathway analysis. And a lot of tools have been developed for gene expression analysis. But there are also a lot of additional tools. There are tools for metabolo metabolomics and other things like that um, that we know about and we can talk to you guys about, but it might not come up too much in the examples in the lecture. But the concepts that we're going to be talking about are very general um, and can be applied to any type of gene list. And that's what we've tried to focus on because of the diversity of possible experiments that people do. Um, we've tried to be general and um, concept oriented to uh, uh, to allow you to translate that information to and that knowledge to whatever you're working on. Okay, so um, kind of motivation for this course is uh, the um, problem that people often have when they start using large scale omics data, genomics, proteomics, metabolomics, and um, you know it takes a long time when you're initially starting out to organize everything and get it working, unless you have a nice core facility sometimes. Um, but often, um, you know, once you do that, you're happy that it's working, and, um, but then you might get a lot of information coming out of these systems. You might get thousands of hits, thousands of genes, and then the question is, how do I deal with all of this information? Um, am I really going to have to go through? Sorry, to interrupt, can I please just start? Yeah. Um, Am I really going to have to go through each of these genes one by one and looking them all up in, in the literature? Uh, so um, one of the traditional ways that people over the past 10 years or so have been trying to analyze this type of data is to um, develop, well, work with uh, software and algorithms that try to take a gene list and tell you something about what's interesting about that gene list. And generally, interestingness means enriched in known pathways, complexes, and functions. And the reason why those are usually interesting is because people, when they do a genomics experiment or omics experiment, they usually want to know something about the mechanism that's underlying what they see. Um, so if they see a lot of changes in gene expression, and um, a tool can tell them that all those changes in gene expression are, you know, the responsible molecule is a single transcription factor or microRNA, that would be very valuable to understand something about the mechanism underlying that, that observation of all those genes changing. And that's a hypothesis also that you can go test by overexpressing or um, under, you know, um, knocking down a microRNA. Um, so people often um, uh, start with uh, a lot of data. Um, they might rank it in some way um, or cluster it. Either way, you get a, a gene list. Um, the gene list could be ranked if you're using some kind of ranking technique, like they might be ranked by differential expression. Um, and then the uh, general idea is that we want to combine all the previous knowledge that we have about genes in, and uh, come up with some interesting um, uh, finding in this list. Um, and it obviously saves time compared to the traditional approach where you're looking in PubMed for each gene one at a time. Okay, so as I was saying, and this is a little bit of summary, um, pathway analysis helps you to gain a, some mechanistic insight into ge genomics data. It might be involving uh, identifying a master regulator, uh, drug targets, uh, characterizing pathways that are active in a sample, which is a little bit more descriptive, but it might just tell you something about what's going on in that sample. Are the cells growing? Are they dying? Um, and, uh, and, and for the purpose of this course, pathway network analysis is any type of analysis that involves pathway or network information, and I'll talk more about what that information is. Um, so it's commonly applied to help interpret lists of genes. The most popular type is pathway enrichment analysis, which is what we'll focus on today, but there are many others that are useful that you'll, you'll see. Pathway enrichment analysis is just, just a very brief version of it, and we'll come back to this many times today, is um, trying to see if there are pathways that are enriched 
in your gene list more than you would expect by chance. So if you have 100 genes and 50 of them are involved in the cell cycle and you look in the genome and only 1% or 5% of the genes are involved in the cell cycle and genome, then the fact that you have 50 out of 100 or half of your gene list that's in the cell cycle, that's highly enriched compared to what you would expect if you're just picking genes randomly from the genome. So that's a very important principle, sort of statistical enrichment of some signal in your data where that signal in this case is some pathway or network information. Okay, so a couple of examples just to give you a sense of um, the utility and the power of some, some of these types of analyses. These are two really um, nice examples that um, showcase the, the method, but, um, the, but there are many out there, and these are two that we were involved in. Um, so this um, first example is uh, studying autism spectrum disorder um, with Steve Scherer, who's a, a autism researcher at the University of uh, Toronto at SickKids. Um, and uh, autism um, is highly heritable. Um, depending on your stringency of diagnosis, uh, there's a high twin concordance. And when this project was started, there was 5 to 15 percent single gene uh, dis uh, mutations that were known to be related to autism, including chromosomal rearrangements. But about seven or eight years ago, people discovered that copy number variation is very important in autism genetics. And, um, and in particular, there was some evidence that de novo or rare copy number variants were involved. So what this team did was they, um, they analyzed copy number variants, focusing on rare copy number variants. So copy number variants are whole regions of the genome that are deleted or amplified. Um, they used a SNP chip that has SNPs, about a million SNPs uh, spread around uh, marking uh, different regions of the genome spread quite evenly across the whole genome. And then if they, um, uh, and there was about a thousand cases and controls, um, and if there's a series of SNPs in the genome that are not uh, present in the DNA sample, they're not detected, then that would be a deletion. And otherwise, um, if it's uh, more, a higher intensity on that, that uh, chip marker, then you'd expect that that might be an amplification. So they were looking for rare copy number variants. Um, which means that they only looked at ones that were present at 1% or less frequency in the whole population. Um, so um, when they did this, they were looking to see how initially how copy number variants affected genes. And they had a few genes that were associated with, that were affected by these CNVs and were associated to cases. Um, just a few, just a handful. Um, and so what we looked at is um, how uh, copy number variants are affecting pathways. And um, when we did that, we came up, we, we actually found a, a rich set of pathways that are affected by copy number variation. Um, and there are all sorts of pathways here. You'll, uh, we'll be teaching you how to make these types of diagrams um, later today. Um, but uh, each one of these little symbols, triangle or circle, is a pathway. And um, these, uh, they're kind of organized into groups, um, cell proliferation proliferation. And one of the ones that was quite interesting was co uh, central nervous system development. A lot of um, pathways were already known to be involved uh, to be related to intellectual disability and autism before um, the pathways that came up. So this provided a much richer picture than looking at things just gene by gene. One of the interesting things with this analysis is that when we looked at individual pathways, we found that the same gene in that pathway wasn't mutated over and over again in the different samples. And that's to be expected because we're focusing on rare copy number variants. Um, instead, you had 20 or 30 or 100 genes in the pathway, and there was, a, a, the, you know, that pathway could be affected differently in every patient, in every different patient. So each patient had a different way of deleting a gene in that pathway. A different gene was deleted. And only when you put all of that information together into a, a, recognizing that those genes are part of a pathway did you see uh, that that there's this really strong signal. So looking at individual genes, it's you know each gene's different. So I don't see this recurrence. To this, there's no signal. But when you put all of that information together, you see like a dozen patients all affected in the um, you know a, a particular central nervous system development pathway um, because a gene is deleted in that pathway somehow. Um, so please interrupt with questions if you have any. Just put up your hand. Um, I'm just going to go through this and I'm happy to take questions in the middle. Okay, so the second example is, so this example really kind of 
illustrates the how you can gain statistical power using pathway analysis approach. So in this case, it was able to collect rare counts of information from different genes and put them together into one bin, and then you can do one statistical test on a pathway and you get a much stronger answer. Because instead of working with one count at a time, different patients, now you're working with a dozen counts. Um, so that's a very, very important concept that's uh, very useful. Um, so uh, the second example is um, a, a more recent study. Uh, this one is also brain related. Um, it's working with Michael Taylor, who's a neurosurgeon at, at, also at the Hospital for Sick Children. Um, one of the cancers that he, so he, he studies cancer. Um, one of them uh, in, in particular is ependymoma, which is a cancer of the ependymum, which is a lining of the central nervous system. And one of the, it, there's a number of different types now known about this, this cancer. Um, one of the most common anatomical locations is in the posterior fossa, which is the brain stem and the cerebellum. Um, it affects, it's the third most common uh, brain tumor in children. And a few years ago, Michael used gene expression analysis to find that there were two major types of uh, posterior fossa ependymoma. Um, type A, which is, affects the youngest patients um, and has a, a really bad prognosis. And type B affects the oldest patients, still children, but it actually has an excellent prognosis. So even though the pathologists, um, when they look at these samples, they know it's coming from the same brain region, um, and they, can't, they, they couldn't really differentiate these things. When you looked at gene expression, it turns out that there's basically two different diseases. Um, one has a terrible outcome, and one has a great outcome. Um, it's really different. You know, we also looked at the pathways involved in this and saw that there were very different pathways activated in these two types. So that's a, another use of pathway information. Pathway analysis is to um, kind of support your statements that you have two different biological functions, for instance, in, a, in, a, in um, samples that you're looking at. So if you sort cells, for instance, with flow cytometer and you do some gene expression on two different cell populations and you see very different pathways coming out from each one, that might support that you have two different functional cell populations. So that's a, another, another example. Okay, so Michael um, and colleagues um, followed up on this by doing a whole bunch of genome sequencing. Um, and, uh, and unfortunately, strikingly, and this is the first time we've ever seen this, there were basically no mutations that were found. Um, so in this, especially in this uh, type A, the serious type, um, there were no recurrent mutations and the patients only had one or a couple of mutations per, per sample, you know, per patient, even with whole genome sequencing. Um, it, it's um, the first time that's really been seen in cancer because cancer, hallmark of cancer is um, is uh, genome instability, and you usually see lots of mutations. But um, in this case, you don't see that, and one of the reasons might be that the children are very young, and they haven't had a lot of time to generate, you know, uh, acquire mutations. Um, but it also might be that this cancer is different than, than other cancers. Um, so they then looked at methylation. So even with doing pathway analysis on this, doesn't really find anything because there's no signal there at that level. Um, so he moved to methylation to look at methylation of DNA, CPG islands, which are um, you know, focused on promoter regions of genes. The idea is if there's a promoter region of a gene that's highly methylated, it's likely to be silenced in its gene expression. Um, and, um, and the result of this was actually a very clear signal between these two different subtypes. So it seemed that Meth DNA methylation was an important aspect of the difference in gene expression that was seen, and um, there were about 2,000 genes that were significantly differentially methylated. Um, he looked. He actually, his lab looked at looked at this list in standard pathway analysis methods, and it didn't really show much. Um, and we ended up um, doing a little bit more detailed work on it. Um, uh, one we found, uh, we used a bigger database of pathway information that we collect in our lab, and actually we can tell you about this during the lab, um, just for convenience, but there's, um, uh, and uh, it, we collect a lot more information than sort of is maybe available in standard tools, and we used a, a little bit more of this um, appropriate statistical test um, that uh, was um, tailored for the data, um, in this case, uh, it was also kind of rare information, low counts, and so um, we can talk a little bit about that. We won't go into too much detail on 
choosing different statistical methods if your pathway analysis isn't working unless you have specific data that, that we can um, uh, we see is uh, needs that on a, in a normal basis. But the interesting thing here was that a single pathway came out. Um, there were no, you know, we searched 10,000, 15,000 pathways, and only one was uh, significant. It was targets of uh, a, a complex, a protein complex called PRC2, polychrome repressive complex 2, that is um, uh, involved in methylating histones and subsequent methylation of DNA. So it definitely seems to be relevant. Um, and um, when we told Michael that, uh, and he started looking into this complex, he realized that people are really interested in this complex from a drug discovery point of view. GlaxoSmithKline is uh, building a molecule that in inhibits the methylation enzyme in, in this EZH2. Um, and uh, there are drugs on the market that repress DNA methylation. And um, what's, um, so that that's quite interesting because this tumor doesn't have any um, known ke uh, chemical therapy. Basically, it's radiation and surgery, which is the sort of basic treatment. Um, it's very, de uh, it's uh, very debilitating um, to do brain surgery on, a, on, on anybody, basically, but especially children. Um, so they really want to avoid that. Um, so this represents the first rational target that was discovered in this tumor. So that's highlighting this idea that you get some, you might get some mechanistic insight into your data by, do, by doing pathway analysis. So in this case, the mechanistic insight is that this protein complex seems to be activated. And in this case, we're really lucky. There's only one thing that came up, um, which is very unusual. Um, and uh, the um, um, and they were actually able to get a drug and try it out in a patient. And um, this patient had a uh, tumor that had metastasized their lung and was doubling in size uh, in two months. Um, and they gave one course of a anti-DNA methylation drug that was on the market, and it stopped the tumor growing um, basically right away, and the patient actually felt better and was start able to kind of run around. Um, and, um, and then that lasted for over 15 months, which was, you know, basically um, 15 months more than was expected and would have been um, good for the, the kid. Yeah? Gary, sorry, just to kind of switch back to the question. I saw the previous graph, it was a Q value. Yes, so Quaid is going to talk all about Q values and P values after this in the morning. Yay! Yeah. <laughs> so, this is help, hopefully motivating you guys to see the power of this, and then you'll be happy to learn about Q values. <laughs> and it's not, yeah, we chose the person, the instructor whose name is, starts with Q to talk about that. Okay, Quaid, sorry, bad joke. Um, okay, so. Um, so <laughs> so uh, the to so, so those are two examples that kind of just illustrate the you know some ex uh, exciting discoveries that you can make with pathway analysis um, and um, but but to summarize the benefits of pathway analysis versus focusing on an analyzing your data transcript by transcript or snip by snip is that it tends to be easier to interpret because it works with familiar concepts pathway information that biologists learn about. Um, it identifies possible causal mechanisms, which can be very useful. Uh, it could predict new roles for genes. So you might see a gene that you don't know anything about, and it's acting similarly to a whole bunch of other genes that are all in the same pathway or network region. And Quaid will talk about the, that later um, when we talk about gene mania and gene function prediction. Um, it improves statistical power, as I mentioned. So generally, um, when you have thousands or tens of thousands of elements you might even have millions, and if you're working with GWAS data, um, like millions of SNPs, um, each one of those, uh, when you're doing certain tests, each one of those um, needs to be anal analyzed with its own statistical test. Um, when you're working with the level of pathways, you have many fewer tests, and that reduces the problem of multiple testing correction, which Quaid will talk about. Um, and as I mentioned, it aggregates data from multiple genes into one pathway, so it's, that's two different ways that it improves statistical power. Um, it's often more reproducible. reproducible. So one of the um, things that people noticed when they were trying to use gene expression data to, um, to, uh, to, to create biomarkers that are predictive, diagnostic of um, particular diseases or predictive of outcome is that different people who, for instance, were studying breast cancer and wanted to predict you know, metas whether the breast cancer was going to metastasize, they would have, collect different samples and they would 
all collect gene expression, and then they would create a biomarker, and the biomarker genes that group A found were totally different than the ones that group B found. However, if you look at the pathways that, that they um, relate to, the pathways were often very similar. So that's what I mean by it might increase reproducibility across, across data. Um, and, um, and it facilitates integration of multiple data types. So one thing that you might want to do is you might be collecting different types of data and you can um, look at everything at the pathway level and you'll see how they relate, um, um, which might not be as easy if you have treating all the data sets independently and, looking at, and not looking at the pathway level. Okay, so um, um, any questions so far? So pathways versus, uh, we talk about pathway and network analysis. Um, many of you probably n know about pathways. The sort of standard pathway that we learn about in biology is kind of a process diagram. This binds to this, and then this happens, and there's a lot of details. This phosphorylates that. Um, so it's, it's often very detailed, high confidence information. It comes from potentially decades of literature. EGF receptor pathways being studied for 65 years or so. And, um, um, and uh, on the other hand, network information kind of looks like this. You might have just connections between uh, genes. Um, each of these circles represents a gene. You might have some information about which gene represses another gene and which gene activates another gene, but you might not. It might just be A binds to B or A is co-expressed with B. Um, and uh, typically this information is a little bit more noisy um, because it comes often from large-scale studies. However, it's it's often um, broader coverage of the genome. So if we just want to focus on pathways that are very well studied, you might only be able to cover 25% of the genome. But if you consider all the high throughput data that's being published, you might get closer to 100% of the genome. And so that might be important when you um, are, you know, working with genomics or omics type data because omics type data often uh, gives you information about the whole genome. And so you might get information about parts of the genome that people haven't studied before, and um, you won't find that information in a pathway database, but you might find it in a network database. So um, there's um, um, this, this figure is from a review that's good, going to be published very soon um, in Nature Methods, I, uh, I think, um, and um, uh, it sort of summarizes three main types of pathway and network analysis. Um, so one is um, enrichment of fixed gene sets. That's what we'll focus on today. Um, that uh, tools like GSEA, gene set enrichment analysis, and G-Profiler we're going to cover. And um, the idea here is that there are, um, similar to the autism case that I mentioned, so the idea here and this cell cycle example I mentioned where you have overrepresentation of the cell cycle in your list of 100 genes. Um, there's also um, ways of, uh, so basically what that does um, is um, it finds uh, biological processes that are known that are altered in your sample. Um, and this, this, is, this slide is from sort of more cancer-oriented perspective, um, which is what this uh, review article when it's published is a little bit more cancer-oriented, but um, the, uh, the second type is we call de novo subnetwork construction and clustering. So this uses network information. Um, uh, so the first one uses gene sets, uses pathway information that's represented as gene sets. So we actually, um, we'll talk about this more, but we basically take information like this, a detailed pathway, we throw away all the details, we just say, this set of genes is in a pathway. Like here's the gene, here are the genes that are in, in the cell cycle. And that's sort of the, the, the way that we represent pathways for this first one, um, this first uh, uh, type. Um, for the second type, we, we use a network. And that network might be very big. Um, it might involve 10,000 or 15,000 genes. Um, and we layer on the data that we have, like gene expression data, and then we try to see if there's some region of the network that's significantly uh, changing in our data. So if it's gene expression data, we would, we would look for differential gene expression, but also in a region of the network that's uh, densely connected. And what that's interesting for is it might identify new pathways that you don't know much about. Um, sometimes we might call those modules if they're, or systems, if they're, you know, connected to each other more than you would expect. Um, we might not know much about them. Um, and um, uh, this type of analysis would kind of give you those, those modules. 
Um, and then there's also um, uh, pathway-based modeling, which is a little bit more detailed. So um, how are pathways activities altered in a particular patient? Um, it's a little bit more mechanistic. We're actually not going to cover this in too much detail. Um, one of the, uh, these methods are a little bit more tricky to get working these days. They're a little bit newer. They do, re they require more information. For instance, they require multiple types of genomics data often. Um, and uh, um, one, pop uh, one that pretty powerful one is called Paradigm. Um, and that is, um, um, you can get, you know, I think more mechanistic information and look at it in your, in a, a per sample basis. So I, we, um, we'll focus on other ways of getting that information and you can ask questions about, about these more advanced methods. Okay. So I'm now going to go over a workflow that we've created that tries to summarize a lot of the information in the course. It doesn't include everything in particular. It's focused mostly on the first two days of the course. Um, but, um, it's um, uh, the, the third day is more about gene regulatory network analysis, and there's uh, many elements of, of that um, related to this, but for this workflow is kind of focused on day one and two. Um, the general idea of pathway and network analysis is that you collect some kind of omics data. Um, you normalize and score it. Uh, so in gene expression, you have to normalize it and compute the differential expression. In uh, GWAS, you have to take your SNP array and you have to uh, normalize it and then do genotype calling. In proteomics, you have to do a um, take the, the mass spectra and you have to search uh, a database using a software to identify proteins and then they're ranked by um, you know particular statistical method. Um, so each genomics data typically has its own way of normalizing and scoring things. We're not so we're not going to talk about how to do that in this course. We assume that you're coming in with knowledge um, about how to do that. We can talk about it if you want, um, but uh, those types of normalization and scoring are often very standardized, for especially for established types of omics techniques. If you're working with a new omics technique that doesn't have an established normalization method, um, that's a method development uh, problem that somebody has to solve to get that omics data set working well for lots of people. Um, the outcome of this is the gene list. That's sort of where we're starting from in this course and where we're trying to focus on. And as I, as we talked about already, you know, the goal is to learn something about the underlying cellular mechanism. So breaking that down, this little box, this is what we're really, this box is what we're going to focus on here. Um, you know, we can visualize and identify interesting pathways and networks. So we, we showed some examples. And then often once you find, um, you might get a a lot of pathways coming out of your analysis. Um, if you're lucky, um, there's lots of information in your data set, and, uh, and, and then now, instead of having a thousand genes, you might have 500 pathways to look at. Um, a lot of the pathways might be related to each other, so we'll show you methods of how to visualize that and reduce the redundancy. Um, but often what you want to do at that point is figure out which pathways look interesting for further drill down. So you might see a pathway that is um, well known. Oh, I'm studying cancer, and the cell cycle is, you know, active. I know that. So that that's 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 pretty standard knowledge. Um, you expect to find that, and you find it. And it's actually a good validation that, that your system is working. Um, you might find a pathway that is uh, really novel, and we never seen that pathway come up with this type of. Um, analysis that, or this type of experiment that we're doing, and that might be really interesting, um, but um, you might actually not be able to follow up on it too easily because maybe it, lipid biosynthesis comes up and you don't know anybody who studies lipid biosynthesis. So there might be a whole range of different pathways that come up, and you often what people will do is pick an interesting pathway that kind of relates to their hypotheses, their way of thinking, and um, ideally you would pick the best pathway, the most uh, a uh, strong signal in your data, and I would recommend going for it, but sometimes it's not practical um, to study certain, certain areas of biology. So that's a little bit of an interesting thing that happens with genomics, is that if you ask such a broad question, you get back any possible answer, um, you should be ideally prepared to follow up on it, but if it's a pretty tall order, it's a big task to say to someone, okay, I'm going to tell you about any area of biology, and now you have to go and do some experiments to validate that. Um, so Keep that in mind, I guess. Um, something we notice, um, and then ideally you'd kind of publish some model explaining the data. So these these steps, these um, mechanistic in interpretation steps, kind of give you some hypotheses. 
um, you might be able to take those hypotheses and experimentally work them up and come up with a mechanistic model that that helps. You might find a drug target. Um, so that that's you know what your what our goal is. Okay, so now I'm taking these three boxes and I'm going to expand them further. Uh, sorry, I'm taking all these boxes and I'm going to expand them further in the next slide. So this is a much busier slide, um, but what it shows you is various different paths that you need to take to uh, depending on the data that you have. So one of the comments that we've gotten in previous versions of this course is that um, we, we're trying to teach the concepts. Um, so we talk about gene, uh, we talk about um, uh, enrichment analysis. But then people say, well, how do I do enrichment analysis with protein expression? How do I do enrichment analysis with meth DNA methylation? There's all sorts of different ways of getting a gene list out of your data. And so these blue boxes at the top um, here kind of talk about where the gene lists come from, the different types of data, and you can just look at them. Um, and so, oops, my slide is messed up here. I'm going to quickly fix it. Hmm, looks fine on my... There it is. Weird. Okay, so um, um, so often um, the experimental methods that people have that generate gene lists are um, molecular profiling data, gene expression data is pretty common, protein expression data is a little bit more resource intensive to get access to, but there's increasing amounts of that data. Um, the, the, the basic version of it is that you identify uh, a bunch of genes or proteins and that generates your gene list. Um, you can also quantify some aspect of those genes. I mentioned differential expression for, for, um, for gene expression. Um, and um, uh, um, for protein, you might have the absolute values of the protein concentration in the sample. Um, you can rank your um, you can rank your genes based on some score that you might have. It might be the score of uh, statistical association in the GWAS study of that markers associated with that gene for your cases versus your controls. So think about, when you're thinking about your gene list, think about two types, just the set of genes, or if you have a score associated with that, that's something important that you can rank your genes based on that and that is additional information that you have about your gene list. And we'll talk about methods that use those two types of information differently and you can get more uh, better results if you have more information, this ranking information might be able to give you better results. Um, another way that people get gene lists is by taking a lot of different data samples and, and uh, cluster them to find patterns that are similar across data, across the samples. So if I have 100 uh, gene expression experiments and I see, uh, I cluster the, the results, I might see that uh, 20 genes are acting very similarly across those 100 experiments. They all go up at the same time, they all go down at the same time, and so those 20 genes, I would say, are related somehow. They're, they're following the same pattern. They might be involved in the same pathway. They might be involved in a set of pathways, uh, some larger process that's regulated um, across the experiments in the same way. And, um, and so clustering will identify those, and that list itself, that tw list of 20 genes, is a gene list that you can analyze. And that with pathway analysis, and you might be able to get some information about why those genes are going up and down. Um, protein interactions uh, or molecular interactions is another kind of type of data that's a general type of data. So we have protein interactions, I, I, a couple of people are studying that, uh, transcription factor binding to DNA and uh, genes that they might be binding to uh, or might be regulating, uh, microRNA targets. Um, so there's a lot of ways of getting targets of a gene, and this usually just gives you a list. So I have a protein, and I want to find out what it connect, what it binds to. I think people mentioned BioID. Um, that's what you guys are mentioning. So that's, for instance, one way of um, getting access to proteins that are in the neighborhood of your of your protein, and um, and that would define a list. Um, and uh, it also gives you network information, and so that network information we can we can use as well. Um, so there's many other ways. I think I've mentioned these. Uh, there might be other examples in the class as well. Um, the point that I'm trying to make is that gene lists come from different places, and um, this, these blue boxes kind of give you a sense of some major examples. And so if you look at that, you might come up with some ideas about how your experiments that you're working can be con converted into a gene list. Um, so the next thing is um, um, 
the sort of meaning of the gene list. So at the um, depending on your experiment, your gene list might mean different things. So if I'm doing a gene expression experiment, um, there's sort of a notion that in the cell, uh, genes are not regulated randomly, they're regulated for a purpose. So if I'm going to turn, if the cell is going to turn on a bunch of genes, it's, it's for something, right? It's to react, respond to a stimulus. So there's some systems that it will turn on and it won't keep those it won't necessarily keep those systems on all the time because that's wasteful of energy. So there would be some idea, there's some idea that the cell likes to turn things on when it needs them and it turns on whole systems to react to some, some method. So if I see genes changing, it kind of goes back to that concept and says there might, must be some pathways that, that are being turned on. Um, and so um, if you do a gene expression experiment, you might get information about biological systems. Um, however, if you might also be doing some kind of genetic screen um, or some other type of experiment that doesn't give you information so much about pathways, it might give you information about uh, a, a cellular location, like I'm doing some purification and I see a whole bunch of things that are in the mitochondria. Or um, I'm doing a uh, linkage analysis, some genome-wide association study, and I get that I find that a whole chromosomal region is associated with my disease, and I'm not sure which gene is involved in that. There might be a hundred genes in that chromosomal region. So, um, so the point of the slide is just that you, ha you should just think about the types of information that's present in your gene list, what you expect based on biological assumptions. Um, we, I also mentioned that um, once you have your raw data, you have to normalize it. Um, and for the purpose of this, present of this uh, workshop, we assume that, as I mentioned, that you're doing standard normalization, background adjustment, quality control, and you'll, you're using statistics that are increasing your signal and reducing your noise. Um, just because uh, people often ask about, even though we're not covering it, people often ask what kinds of, um, you know, ways do I, uh, you know, what is the sort of way concept that I would use DNA methylation, for instance. So, for instance, if you're, if you're focusing on DNA methylation, you might want to score methylation of gene promoters, and that relates to uh, silencing of genes. Um, or, um, you know, I, I talked about these other examples. So these kind of orangey boxes here uh, just help provide some examples of how you go from your raw data to a gene list, um, in a, and, and just to give you a sense of different ways of doing it. Okay. So then you have your biological question, um, and this sort of relates to the types of information that, that, that's in the, the gene list. Um, but there are a few different things that you can do with a gene list, a uh, few different types of questions that you can answer with a gene list once you have it. Um, so one thing you can do is summarize all the biological processes. As I said, it's fairly descriptive, but it, it might help differentiate samples, the function of different samples. Um, you can uh, identify pathways that are different between samples, and that might give you some mechanistic insight into the differences, like apoptosis is present in the sample. Um, it's active in the sample. Um, you might be able to find a controller for a process, and that's mostly what we're going to talk about on day three. Um, and uh, um, you might be able to find that a pathway is regulated by a transcription factor. Um, you can find pa new pathways or new pathway members. Um, can discover gene function, so we'll talk about this, and you might be able to find a drug, um, like I, I mentioned earlier. So just to summarize, just to give you a, um, I think I've mostly said this, but today we're focusing mostly on pathway enrichment analysis, which a a addresses this kind of summarize and compare idea. So summarize your data, compare between samples. Um, tomorrow we're going to focus more on network analysis. So that's useful to find new pathway members, identify functional modules, predict gene function, and then the third day is about regulatory network analysis, um, which is more about finding and analyzing controller molecules. Um, and that's sort of summarized by these green boxes here. So what we've uh, tried to do is um, show you that you can take a, a gene list and you can send it to uh, pathway, and pathway analysis type of um, pathway type analyses, this is more of a network type analysis, and these um, yellow highlighted words here are names of software that can be used for each type of analysis that's present in the box. So we're going to talk about this one, for instance, um, 
today. Um, uh, visualize and identify interesting pathways. And at the bottom here, we have mechanistic drill down. So um, for instance, once you drill down to mechanism, you might want to overlay your, you might find a pathway that's, say you, you take your gene list, you run a pathway analysis, you get 100 pathways that result, and you visualize them in a way that we're going to tell you about today. Um, and uh, you identify your interesting pathway, then you zoom in and you say, okay, now I want to see what's going on with this pathway in my data. So it'd be nice to overlay your data onto that pathway, for instance. So PathVisio is a, is a um, software that helps you take your genomics data and overlay it onto a diagram of a pathway so you can reason over it. Um, and, uh, and you might want to, you might find some genes that you're not familiar with, so you can look them up and try to predict their function. Um, integrate additional information. Um, so there's a lot of complexity here. We're not going to talk about every detail of this during this uh, workshop. We're not able to cover it all. Um, but um, the purpose of this is to kind of give you some big picture view of the process, the kind of way of thinking about this workflow. And um, hopefully it's, it's useful and you can use it to follow aspects of the course. Okay, so any questions so far? Okay, so it's introduction, it's pretty clear. Um, uh, I'm now going to talk about um, just a background of information that we need to all know to really go into this pathway enrichment analysis idea that Quaid is going to cover in more detail. Um, so um, as I have mentioned multiple times, um, when you ha uh, if we want to do pathway enrich this pathway enrichment idea is that you have uh, a pathway that's statistically enriched in your gene list more than you would expect, given the frequency of the genes in that pathway in the genome. So um, generally there is, um, and this sort of summarizes it here, and Quaid is going to go into this in a lot more detail, um, each time you do one of these analyses, you have to take your gene list, and you have to take some pathway information, and you have to take each pathway one by one and compare it to see, do that statistical test to see if, it, if, if it's enriched. Um, and so the things that you need for that uh, are your gene list and pathways, uh, pathway information. And then the statistics are in, are in this box, so Quaid's going to cover that. But in, just as for introductory purposes, and we usually about half the class knows some of this material and the other half doesn't, we want to get everyone on the same page with some of the basics. So we're going to cover uh, some general um, t concepts and tips related to um, the basics of, of these two concepts. So one is the gene list, some general ideas about it, um, uh, sorry, some more specific tips about how gene lists work, um, and also where pathway information might come from. Okay, so um, uh, the gene list is, um, uh, there's just a few couple of important concepts to know about when working with gene lists. Um, so uh, one is that what, the way that you name your genes. So it's not, there are actually many different ways of naming genes as, as you guys probably know. Um, it doesn't have to be genes, it could be metabolites as well, lots of different names. Um, the best kind of names for gene lists are ones that are unique, stable, and that are, you know, names or numbers that help track that gene stably across different versions of databases. And if you give it to your friend, they know what you're talking about. Um, kind of like a social insurance number or the entree gene ID. Um, but because gene and protein expression or protein information is stored in many databases, genes have lots and lots of different identifiers. Um, so I'm going to say ID for identifiers. And it's, it's also important to note that even though you have a gene, gene relates to DNA, RNA, protein, um, and uh, there's different database records for those different categories. So you might have a, a, an identifier for the DNA location of the gene, the RNA transcript, and the protein translatable, you know, translated product of, and a different number for each of those, a different database number for each of those uh, concepts, and also one for the gene. Um, so it's important to recognize the correct record type because um, different tools expect different types of information. So if you have all protein identifiers um, and those protein identifiers relate to different splice variants um, of the, you know, of the protein, the, some tools might not be able to translate that um, nicely to genes, and so you might have to do that yourself. Um, so it's also important to notice that note that the gene records, like the Entree Gene Database, which is at NCBI, the people that make PubMed and the National Library of Medicine, um, they don't store sequence. They just have a 
a name of the gene and some information about the function of the gene. It's the, they're storing information about the concept of the gene. They don't actually say what the sequence is because it might actually have different sequences in different contexts. Um, and then they link to the sequence in other databases. So com there's lots of different identifiers. The common ones, some common ones are listed here. Um, the ones in red we would recommend using because they are more likely to be unique and stable. Um, and I'll tell you about some of the problems that might happen if you don't use these types of things. So usually in my group, for instance, and what I recommend is to use Entree gene IDs if you're working with genes, uh, RefSeq IDs if you're working with RNA transcripts, Uniprot or RefSeq if you're working with proteins. Um, and then there are many species-specific gene symbols um, so human has the Human Genome Naming Commission, um, and they have a, a unique name that is a nice human readable symbol, usually of a gene. These still change sometimes, but they don't change as much as uncontrolled gene names. Um, and uh, um, it's, it's so just good to recognize these different things and try to pick one that's standard. Um, okay, so um, just to mention that um, if you need to translate identifiers between types of naming schemes, so you want to take the gene symbol and translate it to entree gene ID or the gene symbol and translate it to protein ID, there are mapping services that help you convert an identifier from one uh, to another, uh, another type. And um, we're not going to go into too, many, too much detail about that, and, um, uh, but at the end of this lecture, there's a... a do-it-yourself lab that we're not going to go through that talks about that a little bit more. Okay, so um, the um, I might, yeah, so I, I, I think I actually had a slide out of order there, so I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. Um, so one of the, actually maybe I'll just do it right now. Okay, so um, so here's an example of an ID mapping service, uh, gconvert. Uh, there's another one, an ensemble biomart. And as you can tell, you kind of input your identifiers and you choose the type of identifier it is in your organism and you choose the type of output. And then you get, you know, here's choosing a, an identifier and, um, and then you get results. In this case, this gprofiler, gconvert tool might give you some hints about, um, you know, if you, if you provided an identifier that is ambiguous, which means that it, it, it's in databases pointing to two different genes, that's very bad because um, if you uh, have that in your gene list, you might make a mistake in downstream analysis. Um, and the, um, um, uh, the, um, the best example of that is this um, paper that was retracted in Nature in 2003. So this paper was about a gene called HES1. Um, and it turns out that they did all these experiments on HES1, and then they uh, found out that a very early database search error led to them using HES1, not HES1, because there's another gene called HES1, and they had the wrong one. They're both named the same thing. One actually has like a capital E uh, versus a lowercase e, and uh, that kind of thing, when you have case sensitivity in your gene name, is not going to be recognized by many computer systems and just a bad idea. You never ever do that um, because you'll have problems like this. So what these guys did is they did all their experiments on the wrong gene, they published a Nature paper, and then a few weeks later they had to retract the paper. Um, so that's just a really bad, a tragic example. Um, there are different types of uh, errors, so um, the ambiguity that I mentioned is something to be aware of, so don't use identifiers that can map to more than one gene, because you have, have a problem like that HES um, example. Um, so there are, um, often people want to use gene names. This um, I find this often when people are working on protein data. Uh, protein names often have different names than the gene name. Um, it's best to just use the gene name because the protein names aren't standardized often. And um, like people will say P53, for, and the gene name is TP53. If you just type P53 in, you might match lots of genes. But TP53 is a standard symbol for the gene that is, you know, the one that is uniquely, uh, will uniquely determine that gene. Um, another thing um, that happens is that uh, the tools that you use to pro manage your gene list might introduce errors. And the biggest problem is Excel. Um, how many people have noticed when you type in genes in Excel that it might automatically change it to like a date? It might, like if you type in information in Excel, it tries to be smart. And it try, you know, if you type in OCT4, which is a pretty important transcription factor, stem cells, 
it thinks you're talking about October 4th because Excel is made for accountants. Um, and they, <laughs> they, it's much more relevant. October 4th of this date is more relevant to them than the Oct4 gene. So um, uh, how many people have seen this in Excel? Yeah, so it's definitely a problem. Um, the... Um, Exactly, exactly. So by default, Excel does this, but if you choose, for instance, to, t like if you disable these smart options or if you choose to um, paste as text instead of general, so the default format for a cell is general um, and uh, um, that tries to guess what the format is and so it would guess a date. If you just say it's text and I'm just talking about text or just a number, then it won't. Um, and uh, um, uh, the problem that comes up often is if you're working with a big gene list and you just paste it into Excel and then you didn't notice that it actually made a change because it made the change off screen. Like you didn't see that any, you don't, you know, you have a thousand genes and somewhere at the bottom of the list it's changing it. Um, this is funny because there's a paper published a few years ago that kind of tracked these uh, things, this paper here. Um, and actually, some of the Excel auto conversions have made their way back into the databases as the gene name because people are submitting this back to the database. Um, uh, there's also problems reaching 100% coverage. If you have uh, a lot of genes from your RNA-seq experiment, for instance, some of those genes might not be very well studied. In fact, some of them might not be real genes at all. Um, or people are currently debating whether it's a gene. Um, and every time you go check the database, the debate is, it's, you know, moved on to the not a gene and then back to the, it is a gene and back to the not a gene. So it actually will change over time. So some of those, especially those ones that are less well studied, you might not be able to get identifiers in all of your databases because the gene may be brand new. Um, and, uh, and so, um, uh, but if you do have a desire to do this identifier conversion and uh, want to make sure all of your genes are covered, then you can go to different sources to increase your coverage. Okay, so um, these are some recommendations that really uh, try to help with this. So um, for, this is only relevant for protein and genes. Um, it doesn't really consider splice forms. Just a note about splice forms. Um, some experiments give you a lot of information about splice variants of genes. Most pathway analysis systems don't consider that differentiation between different splice forms because all of the databases we have pretty much, I think probably it's safe to say that all of the databases we have about pathways and gene function is really focused around the gene. Um, and it will often consider the longest transcript. Um, and it's a very active area of research to push those databases to update themselves so that they, as we know more information about functional differences between splice variants, that that information gets captured and we see um, that that very important information biologically is actually captured. But right now, the sort of state of the field is very gene oriented and everything, all the splice variants kind of get collapsed. And probably even if they have very different function, the, all those functions will just get collapsed to the gene level. And that gene is involved in these functions. Um, so map have, mapping all of your data to Entree gene IDs or the official gene symbol using a spreadsheet is good. Um, I talked about 100% cover, coverage and I talked about these Excel auto conversions. So you can turn your auto conversions off or format the cells as text before pasting. Okay, so just to summarize, um, we just cut, finished covering some of the basics of working with gene identifiers. Uh, it's not such a problem if you only have a few, but when you have thousands of them, these are kind of good housekeeping things to, to know about um, because it helps reduce errors. Okay, so I'm now moving on to sort of the pathway side of this. Um, this is, you know, these are the two inputs into pathway enrichment. Um, and um, pathway information is quite varied and present available in many different sources. Um, one of the most popular sources is the gene ontology. How many people know about the gene ontology? Okay, a few people know about the gene ontology. Um, and um, so I'm going to talk about this gene ontology because it is a very important source of uh, pathway annotation, not just pathways, some other types of information as well, um, for genes across many organisms. And many pathway analysis tools use the gene ontology. Um, there's some complexities with it that 
need to be explained to really understand how it's how it's working. So the gene ontology is a um, uh, an ontology. The word ontology is a name. It's it means a system for describing knowledge. So it's a way of representing knowledge. In this case, uh, biological concepts, which are terms or phrases, and the relationships between those concepts. Um, and in this case, these are applied to genes. So protein kinase, apoptosis, membrane, those are three terms in biology that are would be part of the gene ontology. It also ha is a dictionary because each term is has a dictionary definition associated with it. So it's actually very useful just as a biological dictionary if you want to look up a term. Um, and um, it's made by the Gene Ontology Consortium, uh, which is a group of databases, uh, model organism databases, and Uniprot, which is a big protein database um, that are responsible for annotating function of genes and, uh, and proteins. So gene ontology is a hierarchical structure um, with the most specific terms at the bottom of the structure. And if you go up, it gets more and more general. So here, this example, B cell apoptosis, um, and then up, uh, if you move up, apoptosis, then program cell death, cell death, death, and physiological process, and all the way up to the top to more and more general things. There's a couple of different types of relationships between these terms. The major ones are is a and part of. So um, B cell apoptosis is a type of apoptosis, which is a type of program cell death. But B cell apoptosis, because this one's red here, I know it's it's part of B cell homeostasis. So this, you know, you can say the nucleus is part of this the cyto, you know the cytoplasm part of the cell. Um, so those are two different major types of relationships. They describe it's organized this way so that it can describe gene function in multiple levels of detail. And um, it's it's important to know that this kind of tree-like structure um, can have cases where the term, the gene ontology term, can have multiple parents. And that's important because, um, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you in a sec, um, that, um, well, I'll, I'll mention in a sec. So there, there are three different uh, major aspects of gene ontology. One is uh, biological process, which is where pathways are defined, um, and also more general processes. Molecular function is a uh, enzymatic function and cellular components are different parts of the cell. So those are three different aspects. Um, gene ontology has um, two different parts. It has the terms that I talked to you about, um, and these terms are defined by database curators whose job it is to review the literature and type information into databases so that we can use it. Um, and um, uh, terms can be added by request. If you want to add one, you can. Um, and there are experts that help with, with major development of new terms, but it's growing over time, um, and there, there are tens of thousands of terms. So this is the number of terms in each of these categories. So there, you can see there's 28,000 biological process terms um, that are defined, each one with a definition. And, um, so the second part of gene ontology is um, annotation. So what the database curators do after they've defined the term is they link it to a gene. So if I have a gene, I can tag it with any number of these terms. So the gene is involved, it's, it's localized in the mitochondrion, it's involved in, uh, you know, it's involved in energy metabolism, and it's, um, you know, its enzymatic function is a um, particular, particular function. Um, so um, that's the idea of annotations, or sometimes called associations, gene associations, or go annotations. Um, there are multiple annotations per gene, so the gene can have multiple multiple functions. Um, some of the annotations are made manually, and some of them are made electronically. Uh, some of them, the electronic ones that are um, done, some of the ones that are made electronically are reviewed by people, and others are not reviewed by people. So it's there are different quality levels of these annotations that's important to me to mention. I'll go over that in a bit. Um, just a quick note um, that. Um, uh, the hierarchical um, nature of this gene ontology means that if you have a particular gene annotated to one of these terms, it automatically, you can infer that it automatically gets annotated to all these other terms. So there's actually lots, you know, once you make this link of a term to a gene, it automatically gets all these other terms. And 
Um, it can also be linked to multiple terms. So there's this, um, often this, uh, a, a lot of gene ontology terms can be associated to a gene. And that can sometimes making, make working with it a little bit difficult um, because, um, uh, for instance, if you just want to take a thousand genes in your gene list and make a pie chart that lists the cellular, where, this, where in the cell the genes are, you have to recognize that the genes can be multiple cellular compartments. Maybe every gene is in multiple cellular compartments and it makes it harder to just come up with a quick summary. Um, that's because they're not unique. Uh, the terms are not unique to genes. Okay, so um, more importantly, um, coming back to this point about annotation sources, that um, uh, some, of, some of the annotation is high, very high quality, curated by scientists. Um, they're typically smaller in number because it's time consuming to create these. Uh, so they also have reviewed computational anal analysis. Um, some types of computational analysis for genes are very accurate. So for instance, if, um, if uh, you take a protein sequence and you run it through a transmembrane domain predictor, uh, those predictors are like 97% accurate or more. So they're very, very good at picking out transmembrane domains and proteins. And as soon as you have a transmembrane domain, you can say it's it's part of the membrane somewhere. So you already get information about the function of that protein. And so that kind of annotation might be very high quality. Um, in addition, addition, some annotation is um, mapped from other species by sequence similarity. So if I have a new model organism that I'm studying, I, I, I noticed someone was talking about bullfrog and other types of, um, I've had people taking this course who are studying bees or other things where they haven't completed a genome sequence um, fully, and I guess, um, um, frog has the Xenopus um, genome sequence, but there might be other organisms that don't. Um, often all the information will come based on sequence similarity to its closest genome. Um, and uh, someone ideally would review that. And if they review it, then, you know, they might identify false positives and remove that. Um, and then there's the, you know, so that's the manual annotation. The other side is fully electronic. It's considered lower quality. And a key point is to be aware of the annotation origin. So um, there are a few bunch of different annotation types. Um, so when you when the curator takes a gene ontology term and links it to a gene, they don't just say, okay, that's it. They they add an evidence. Why did I do that? So it might be that they found a paper that said that this gene is part of this is related to this function. And so they'll actually say uh, TAS, traceable author statement, and they'll put the PubMed ID. Um, or if they say that I'm, if I'm saying that this gene is part of this function because it interacts physically with a bunch of other genes, that, a bunch of other proteins that are um, part of that function, they can say inferred from physical interaction and they can actually tell you what the other gene, proteins are that physically interacted. So there's a lot of information in these annotation files um, and these experimental, these evidence codes tell you the quality of the annotation. So IEA is inferred from electronic annotation. That's like the low qual lower quality one. These are the higher quality ones um, in red here. So this is for your information. Um, a key point, if you're working with a, an organism, um, uh, okay, so one, one issue is that, you know, all major eukaryotic organisms and human are quite well covered. Um, several bacterial and parasite species are covered. Um, new species are added to the, to the list. You can go to this. Um, you can go to the Gene Ontology website and see uh, the the list of species. Here's a um, list of the top uh, most annotated organisms in Gene Ontology. Um, it includes chicken and you know other things that are not always standard um, uh, model organisms. Um, the green is experimental evidence codes, and the um, uh, blue is non non experimental. Um, so the point here is that um, an experimental means that somebody did an experiment in that species, so it's likely to be better quality. Um, the blue is probably mo uh, here in uh, electronic annotation, and so you can see that chicken, which is the one species here that's not, um, you know, probably not the, the, the least common mo model organism, it's not really um, as much of a model organism as some of these other ones, is mostly blue probably because people aren't doing as many experiments in chicken so as they are in, in human. So um, the point here is that, uh, one, be aware of the annotation origin, but you also might be working in a, in a species that 
doesn't have experimental annotations. All the evidence is taken from another related species. And so in that case, you have to use electronic annotation. You might want to review it yourself if you're worried about it. Um, and um, and uh, so you may be forced into that. So that electronic annotation sometimes is useful. Yeah? Right. So, so the curators are well-trained scientists that wouldn't make that kind of mistake um, if they're doing it manually. Um, but if it was based on some kind of electronic text mining, then it might make that mistake. Um, it, sorry? Text mining might be used by these curators to help them queue up information that they'll review manually. Um, it might be used in their pure electronic annotations. Um, so that's why that's a reason that um, the electronic annotations, because they're not reviewed by anyone, they might have mistakes like the one you mentioned. Um, the evidence code tells you how the evidence was collected, and if it's a paper, it will actually have the PubMed ID, and you can go and look at that paper. Um, so yes, in genotology annotations. Generally, the databases will have, if they're curated, they will tell you, the mo you know, I'd say almost all databases, because they're responsible, they will tell you the paper that they read to get the information, um, at least. Um, and they might tell you more, like, we found the information in this figure. Or um, they might uh, say that they collected a bunch of papers and they they uh, learned about the pathway that they were studying and they tried to make their best version of it. So they might even be kind of writing a review article almost at the highest levels. Um, but yes, you can. You should be able to go back to that experimental evidence. Some of it may be high throughput in network databases. Um, like Quaid will talk about G-mania later. And one of the things that you can do is, um, uh, if you have gene expression data, you can go and see which gene expression data set and which paper generated the gene expression data set. And so you can you can find that information. It's not always easy to do. So it is a good good question. Sometimes it's easier than others. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Any other questions? OK, so this is just a quick slide for your information. There's a bunch of databases that contribute to this worldwide effort. Um, a couple of additional gene ontology related concepts. There is this idea of a Go Slim set. So instead of having 28,000 terms for biological process, it will slim it down to maybe 100. And that makes it a little bit more manageable. So I mentioned this pie chart example. So this is kind of a standard thing that sometimes people want to do. Um, that uh, if you have too many terms, it's hard to make a pie chart because um, for the one reason that I mentioned earlier, but also because it might create too many slices of the pie. So you want a, f a fewer possible slices of the pie, and the Go Slim set might help you do that. Um, so there's, there's a couple of official reduced sets. Um, that exist. Just a minor point. Um, there are also many tools and resources that are available that use gene ontology. Uh, and so by looking at gene ontology tools, you might be able to um, find interesting analysis methods. Um, one tool that we recommend is a website called QuickGo. So this is at the European Bioinformatics Institute in uh, Hingston near Cambridge, England, near the Sanger Institute. And uh, they make available this nice browser for gene ontology. So you can type in a gene ontology term, and you'll see uh, this hierarchy here, and you'll get the definitions, etc. You can also um, find the uh, annotations, because um, they load that up from all the gene ontology annotations. And you can actually filter the annotations. You can say, um, just give me annotations for worm, where the um, term is macromolecular complex, or any of its children, and I only want, uh, I don't want to include in uh, electronic annotations. And so you can set these filters and you'll get a result, and that result that I, that query that I just described will give you all of the protein complexes that have experimental support in C. elegans. Um, all of the, all of the terms that are associated with that, and the genes and proteins that are associated with, that, with those terms. Um, there are other ontologies out there. Um, most of them are not very well used. 
Um, but some of them are, like the human phenotype ontology is an emerging ontology that covers a lot of information about human diseases, and increasingly that's starting to get used in, and, and it's present in G-Profiler, which is one of the tools we'll talk about. Um, okay, so I, that really covers a little bit of depth on gene ontology. Uh, to summarize, it's an important source of gene function annotation and pathway information, especially the biological process part of gene ontology. Um, but there are many other sources of pathway information, um, mainly pathway databases. Um, so um, one of the sites that we um, uh, have uh, developed is called PathGuide. My, my lab keeps track of as many pathway databases as we can. And the last update last year um, up increased the number of pathway databases to 550. So there's actually a lot of pathway databases. Um, most of them are, there's a lot of specialized pathway databases as well. So there's pathway databases that just focus on HIV human interactions um, or just focus on the innate immunity, for instance, um, and, uh, or, or specific categories of, of information like transcription factors and their targets. Um, MSIGDB is a uh, set of, it's a pathway database that's mostly uh, um, where all the pathways are, related, are, are represented as gene sets, and um, that is used by the GSEA software gene set enrichment analysis, which we'll talk about as one of the um, most common uh, pathway enrichment tools, and they make available um, a database that's, that's fairly um, extensive. Uh, as part for, for their tool. Um, Pathway Commons is a sort, this is a project from my group in collaboration with Chris Sander at Sloan Kettering Cancer Center um, to collect pathway information from many different sources and try to make it easier to use. And so there are right now 18 pathway databases and major pathway databases in Pathway Commons. Okay, so um, um, I just want to do a time check. I think I might be possibly ending early here, um, and um, uh, okay, so I've covered um, pathways, which are gene ontology, biological process, and also pathway databases, like Reactome. So Robin, who's here in Lincoln, who'll talk tomorrow, will go into more detail about the Reactome database. It's one of the um, premier pathway databases. It's mostly focused on human, um, and it's developed uh, led out of the center, actually. Um, but there are many other types of annotation. So I mentioned gene ontology, molecular function, and cell location. Um, so if you have gene lists that are relevant for those types of that type of information, so for instance, you're doing um, purification of a of some part of the cell, and you identify a lot of genes that are all present in a particular cell location where you expect to, then you can do your enrichment analysis with the cell location aspect of the gene ontology instead of biological pathways. You should probably do these separately anyway. Sometimes people throw all the gene ontology um, uh, terms together when they do their pathway analysis. I don't think that's a good idea because for two reasons. One, um, it's uh, it generates a lot more redundant information. Um, it worsens your statistical power because uh, each one of those terms represents a different statistical test, and you have to correct for doing multiple testing, which Quaid will, will talk about. Um, and, uh, and so it's best to focus, to think about what your gene set represents, your gene list represents, and then focus on analyzing using the information that's most relevant. Um, so if you don't expect to see enzymatic terms like dehydro, you know, dehydrogenases, um, from your screen, um, don't include that whole category of 15,000 terms in your, um, in your search. Um, or if you're doing something where you really expect chromosome position to be important, you may want to use a gene set database that only relates to chromosome positions. And the MSIGDB database actually has one. So the, I'll, I'll just give you an example where that was, that was kind of interesting. Um, a student that, I, that I'm um, on their thesis committee, they, they, they're doing some gene expression analysis, and they, um, they found that uh, olfactory receptors are really strongly enriched and, um, in, their, in their analysis. Whenever I see olfactory receptors, I immediately think that there might be some issue um, because olfactory receptors are 
often very highly clustered on the genome. So they're all next to each other on the genome. And so if you have some kind of problem with that segment of the genome, like an amplification or a deletion, that will affect your gene expression results. And you will, um, you will get a whole bunch of um, olfactory receptors differentially expressed in your sample. And, um, and because they're all olfactory receptors, they're all part of the same pathway. And so when you run your pathway analysis, you'll get olfactory receptors and all the related pathways like neurotransmission and neural, you know, sensing and a whole bunch of general terms related to sensing, you know, odor. Um, and, uh, and, and you'll get a really strong signal. Um, so what I told her is that, you know, that's a, you know, olfactory receptor. There's a few pathways like this that we know are clustered in the genome, um, his, uh, histones also and some immune uh, um, related molecules, um, adaptive immunity related molecules. Um, and so when, typically when we see these pathways, we might want to check that it's not um, just because of a, like a, a segment of the genome is, is uh, affected. And so you could go to the chromosome position database part of gene ontology, of uh, GSEA, MCDB, and you can run that against your gene list to see if any of chromosome positions are like highly enriched in your gene list, which might indicate that there's some chromosome position effect. Um, similarly, you can use disease associations if you think that might be relevant, um, or, or any of these other, other sources. So um, the, um, the issue with these other sources um, is that they're quite varied. So Fortunately, a lot of them, like the first ones here, gene ontology, chromosome position, disease association, um, are present in systems like Ensemble. How many people know about Ensemble? Ensemble is a genome browser. Um, it's like the UCSC genome browser. It's run by the uh, Sanger Institute and the European Bioinformatics Institute. I really like Ensemble because it has a, um, a nice tool called Biomart which allows you to make quite advanced queries of the system, and you can give it a gene list, and it will um, sort of work like this. So you, you go to um, Biomart, and you um, select your um, database, so Ensemble Genes is the gene database. Um, you select an organism, so in this case I selected Homo sapiens, and then once you select your genome, you can select filters. So one of the filters is um, protein domains, for instance, here. I only want um, proteins of, you know, I only want genes to come back that have this protein domain. Or if you click and open this gene uh, box here, you will see that um, you can type in a gene list, and it will ask you what identifier it is, and then that will select all those genes. And then once you've selected your genes out of the whole genome, um, there's a little count button, which I didn't explain here. Um, but uh, you can press that to see, to check that it recognized all of your information. And then you can go shopping, which is the Biomart idea, um, and select a whole bunch of attributes to download. You can download um, gene ontology annotations, disease annotations, uh, external identifiers. So this is one way of converting your gene IDs from one to another. You can find the protein domains that are part of that gene. You can download all the sequences. Um, quite a lot of information can be downloaded about your gene list, and you can save it as a spreadsheet and, um, and, um, and, and use it for uh, analysis. Um, Entree Gene is um, a major source of gene attributes as well. Um, model organism databases often have information, um, and there are others that we can discuss during the lab. Okay, so um, to summarize, um, there's a lot of information out there about function of genes, attributes of genes. Major sources, the gene ontology and some pathway databases that are, are a little bit more active and common. Um, I talked about the gene ontology in, in depth, it sort of summarizes some of the main take home messages. And, um, but there are other uh, sources of, of, of data. Genome databases, genome browsers are like UCSC Genome Browser for Human or Ensemble, which handles lots of different organisms, is a good source of additional information about your gene list. Um, okay, any questions? But it's not, it doesn't cover everything, so there's always additional sources. So sometimes the only way of getting good information that you need is actually going to literature, um, taking a paper. There might be a new paper that was just published, like 
Um, for instance, just a few months ago, the epigenomics roadmap just published a huge amount of epigenomics information about um, how many people, you know, it's only relevant for people studying human, but anyone see these epigenomic roadmap papers? A few people. So they published a massive amount of information about uh, DNA methylation and chromatin immunoprecipitation, and that data is only now filtering into the databases. So um, you might be able to access early if you go out and look for it. Okay, so I'm almost done. Um, just coming back to this, uh, just again to summarize, coming back to this analysis workflow, um, uh, and to repeat, just to go over the concept again, um, you know, the idea is um, you have your raw data that you've collected somehow, you normalize and score it. Um, often, the one thing I didn't mention is that sometimes um, you might be lucky and have a core facility that helps you do this. Um, sometimes, often, a core facility is running, you know, next-gen sequencing to do RNA-seq or something like that. How many people get their data from a core facility? Okay, so some, some people do it themselves. Some people might have their own mass spectrometers in their lab. Um, so it's usually, I personally feel, so you can do your own normalization, and the standard techniques are generally available, widely, widely used. Um, I personally feel it's good for the people that are generating the data to do the normalization, especially if they're doing many uh, of them, because they usually have a sense of the biases that might be coming out of the technology that they're using. So for instance, um, when you're doing next generation sequencing, you can have lane effects. Um, different uh, batch effects per lane. And so they might um, be putting your samples in the lanes in a particular way that is actually useful for a normalization method. And only, you know, they are the best at kind of knowing that information and knowing associated normalization methods that are matched with it. Similarly, if you're, if you're dealing with mutation information that is coming, getting called from next generation sequencing data, there's a huge... Um, amount of bioinformatics work trying to call these mutations and um, and th those mutations are not called very accurately all the time. So if you're, if you're thinking about single nucleotide variants, um, the best pipelines only call that at 80% accuracy. So there's a lot of single nucleotide variants that are coming out of these big studies that are actually noisy. Um, and it's even worse if you're looking at indels and copy number variants. Um, I think indels is like 40 or 50 percent accurate. Um, but it might be quite variable between different sources. And so um, usually there's a lot of technical details involved in that, and the people sequencing are best positioned to use the latest state-of-the-art methods. And so that's why I recommend doing that. So sometimes people come to us and they, they, they've worked with a core facility, and the core facility charges them extra to do the normalization. I personally, and usually it's not that much, I usually say it's worth it. Just let them do it, unless you're really confident that you can do it and it's very easy, like gene expression by microarrays is very easy because it's 15-year-old technology and it's all the same, everybody does it the same way, so that might be easier, but otherwise I kind of recommend that you involve someone who's, who's very knowledgeable about that, it might be you, um, in that normalization. Um, okay, so raw data, normalize, you have to create your gene list somehow, so that might be differential expression defines the gene list, or it might be um, scoring methylation at promoters that defines the gene list, or predicted targets of, of microRNAs, or you have a chip experiment that identifies potential target genes of a transcription factor or DNA binding protein. Those are different ways of generating a gene list, um, and there might be multiple ways of generating a gene list from one experiment. Um, for instance, if you have a lot of gene expression data, you can compute the differential expression between two samples or between two classes, cases versus controls, or you might have multiple different samples, and so you can do all the two-way comparisons, or you can cluster the data, like I mentioned, and each cluster is a gene list. So um, those things might mean different things. Those, those different ways of creating a gene list will mean different things. They'll be trying to ask different questions. So if I'm doing... Um, tumor versus normal or disease versus normal, I want to know what's specific to disease, but I might have two t subtypes of disease and, that I'm comparing, in which case it's not disease versus normal anymore. It's a different question. Um, okay, um, and then um, drilling down, um, so what we'll do um, after this, 
is we'll have a break, I think. Is that right? Yeah. Um, and then um, when we come back from the break, um, we will, um, Quaid will talk about uh, um, the statistics between, behind this enrichment analysis or pathway enrichment analysis. Um, just another note, I always say pathway enrichment analysis because um, I, pathways are usually the, the types of information that people want to look at because it gives them some mechanistic understanding of their data. Um, however, if it's chromosomal location gene sets, it's not pathway enrichment analysis, it's called chromosomal location enrichment analysis. So um, I always use the term pathway enrichment analysis because um, I think it's clearer um, than just saying gene set enrichment analysis because what's a gene set? You don't learn that in biology, we learn about pathways. Um, and uh, okay, so Quaid's going to go over the statistics of these things and we're going to focus on GSEA and G profiler and then there's going to be a lab where you do the enrichment analysis using these tools yourself. Um, and, um, and then in the afternoon, I'll come back and Veronique uh, is a TA who's going to, um, for the course, who's helping, uh, helping lead a lot of the labs. Um, and, um, and then I'm going to come back in the afternoon and talk about uh, Cytoscape, which is um, a network visualization tool that's fairly general for networks, but it's also useful the way we've kind of structured this course, it's useful for creating these graphical representations called an enrichment map of the um, enrichment analysis that helps you, like the autism example that I showed where there was all these bubbles, and um, that is um, a, a tool that is in Cytoscape that you can use. Um, and then we're not going to cover um, too much of this drill down, but I we're noting these, um, these names of software here so that you can... Um, go and look at them and you can see how they work there. Some of them are very simple. I think PathVisio, in this workflow here, PathVisio is the only one that we're not, we're not covering. Um, another one that um, it might be useful is GREAT. GREAT is um, an enrichment analysis that takes in genomic regions. So it, it also works for non-coding regions that you might have. So if, you, if your data includes genomic regions, um, not just gene lists, Great will take the genomic regions and then it will convert it to a gene list for you using some rules that are um, specified. Um, and then tomorrow we'll be mostly focused on this network, identifying interesting networks, um, part of the workflow. Okay? Any questions? There's just one more quick slide, um, which is um, a lab, if you're interested in playing with the gene IDs and, um, and translating them, um, then you can use this demo gene list uh, as a bunch of yeast genes, and you can convert the genes to entree gene IDs using G Profiler and Ensemble Biomart. And I just I just put this up here as something if you want to play with the tools during the lab session, uh, any of the instructors will help you with the, these tools if you want to do that. But it's it's optional. Okay, so we're finished a little bit early, um, but we're on a break.